All right. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, if you'd open your Bible to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. <coughs> this morning, um, we are still in verse 1, uh, which uh, praise God that there are, are verses that are so filled with uh, truth that uh, we can really plant our feet in them. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 1 is the title of the sermon this morning, same as last week, Standing Firm in Freedom. This is the second part, um, and uh, next week we'll be looking at verses uh, 2 through 6. So uh, let me read the verse for us and open us in a word of prayer, and then we will jump into the sermon this morning. Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. And do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Let's pray. God, um, I ask that our that nobody here, including myself, Lord, that I wouldn't be um, become tedious in the preaching of this, Lord. Uh, that you would help me to not get lost in the information and the knowledge, Lord, um, but help me to communicate in a way that this is, this is real and this is truthful and this is helpful to our lives. Help the people, Lord, to have ears that um, are not cumbersome this morning, but are able to listen to your Spirit speaking. We pray and ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. When God uh, had rescued his people from 400 years of slavery and he led them out of Egypt into the desert into a seemingly military trap, the Red Sea was on one side and the world's most powerful army was on the other side bearing down upon them. The people began to complain and to blame Moses and, and even worse, God. And Moses' instructions to the people at that moment was simple but profound. He said, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of our Lord, which he will work for you today. The people didn't need to fight. Not one stone would be thrown, not one sword would be thrusted. They simply needed to stand firm and trust their God. When the Moabites and the Ammonites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat and the people of Israel, Jehoshaphat was afraid and he sought the face of the Lord. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Yahaziel. So, who is that? And Yahaziel came to Jehoshaphat and said, you will not need to fight in this battle, stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. And when the Judaizers slipped into the church at Galatia, like wolves in sheep's clothing, to draw away the flock, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church that he dearly loved, for freedom Christ has set you free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Last week I told you I had 15 questions and or thoughts regarding this verse. There's going to be seven last week and eight today, but good news, I've boiled it down to 14. <laughs> seven last week, seven today. Here we go. Number eight, our first one today, but number eight in the series. How does one stand firm? Now, last week I had asked the question and answered the question of what does it mean to stand firm? And I gave you uh, three non-exhaustive answers from Scripture. Three. They're on the screen. A, it means to persevere in the faith. B, it means to let nothing move you. And C, it means to be watchful, mature courageous, strong. Those were the three answers I gave you. But then the question still lingers, how do I do that? How do I stand firm? 
We, we looked at what it means. How do I do it? Well, let's first answer how we don't do it. Make sure it's clear that we understand how we don't stand firm. We don't stand firm through hard work alone. Make that very clear. Stoicism will not help us in Christianity. There's no room for Stoicism in Christianity. Christian disciplines alone. We don't stand firm by Christian disciplines alone. Christian disciplines are great. They are good. They should be practiced. But in and of themselves will not cause you to stand firm. Being disciplined won't cause you to stand firm alone. Or community osmosis. What's that? You won't stand firm by surrounding yourselves by other firm Christians. And somehow through osmosis it's going to affect you. It doesn't work that way. You won't stand firm that way if that's the only way you're trying to stand firm is through community osmosis so how do we stand firm? How do we do this? Now, I want to be clear. There's one way to answer this question, um, and it's the, probably the best way and the most accurate way. And here's how it is. God will see to it that you do. How do you stand firm? God will see to it. If you are in Christ, God will make sure that you stand firm. God will persevere us in the faith. God will not let us be moved. God will give us sober-mindedness and maturity and courage and strength that we need to stand firm. So I want to make sure that we understand that before we understand this. The question that we are simply looking at this morning is that we want to know, as much as I am humanly responsible to cooperate with God, when we say that God will do it, we're not talking about the fact that we can just sit on our laurels and think that God's going to do all the work. No, we have a human responsibility to cooperate with God in that process. And we want to know as much as I am humanly responsible to cooperate with him, how do I do that? How do I stand firm? And in case you're wondering this morning, Matt, why should I care about this? Why should I care about this question? Here's why. Perhaps the most important question that we have ever been asked or the most important question that you will ever ask yourself is this. How do I become a Christian? How do I get saved? But here's the thing. The second most important question, and maybe the first, depending on how you look at it, is this. How do I stay a Christian? How do I stay saved? The question this morning, how do I stand firm? That's the exact same question. How do you stand firm? How do you stay a Christian? How do you stay safe in a world that's trying to steal your faith with an enemy that's trying to steal your faith? How do you do that? Seven means, seven biblical means to stand firm. We're going to go through these fast because technically if you add seven plus the other six, there's like 13 points this morning. Uh, so let's go through these fast. Number one, hold fast to the word. Hold fast to the word. How do you stand firm? Hold fast to the word. Luke 8, 15. Where do I, where do I get that from? Luke 8, 15. Jesus, in telling the parable of the sower, says, But the seed and the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart, and they hold it fast, and they bear fruit with perseverance. Now, what does that mean? If you remember that parable, without going through it again, there were four seeds, four categories. Some was thrown on the hard, uh, uh, the, the, the concrete, rocky ground. It didn't do anything. Some was uh, sown into uh, good soil, but uh, uh, thorns came and choked it. Uh, some was uh, um, uh, sprouted up, but it didn't have deep roots. And so it, when time of drought or, or rain came, it withered away. And then there was one that went into the soil and it laid deep, deep roots into the soil. And why did it do that? Why did it persevere? Because Jesus said it held fast to the word. It held fast to it. Where else is this idea contained? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 2. Now I will remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand... And by which you are being saved, if, 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 don't miss that if, if, you hold fast to the word I preach to you. If. 
Now, let me be very, very crystal clear. Let me be crystal clear. Don't hear this as a plea to read your Bible. Don't hear this as a plea to read your Bible. It is a plea to read your Bible, but it's so much more than that. It's a plea to hold fast to the Word of God. That's not the same as reading your Bible. You might say, well, what does that mean, Matt? What, what, what are you exhorting us to do? What, what does that look like? Well, let me give an illustration. I like illustrations. I think in illustrations. Um, and it helps me. And I hope it'll be helpful to you. Imagine if you were a journalist in a war. Right? You work for the Washington Post, the New York Times. You're a journalist in a war. And... Um, you're catching a ride on an airplane transport into enemy territory. You have soldiers on the plane with you. The commander of the, the regiment comes to you and he says, hey, our landing gear is not working, so we're going to have to jump. Now, you're a journalist. So he hands you a parachute and a parachute manual. He says, we're jumping into enemy territory. So we're going to have to split up. We can't stay together. We can't run around in enemy territory. We're going to have to split up. You're on your own. Here's a map of how to make it back to camp. He also says, look, I understand you're a journalist, so you don't have any training skills. Here's a survival guide. It'll tell you what you can eat, what you shouldn't eat, how to fire your weapon, how to not fire your weapon. Now, here's the thing. In that moment, would we take the parachute manual, the map, the survival guide, and put them on the airplane bookshelf? I got this. Or would you hold on to those for dear life? Because your life depends on following these instructions, holding fast to them, loving them, looking to them. That's what it means to hold fast to the word. Two, hate sin and love righteousness. Hate sin and love righteousness. Romans 12, 9, abhor, abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 to 22. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. To stand firm in the faith, we must become enemies with our sin and best friends with the righteousness of Christ. Must. Now here's the problem. When we first get saved, we don't necessarily have that. We don't. When we, when, when we first get saved, we don't have this like great disgust of our sin. We, we don't. We might even enjoy it. We might even delight in it to some degree. But with each passing year in our Christian walk, there should be an increasing hatred of our sin and an increasing love of the righteousness of Christ. If we don't hate our sin, listen, if not just like you dislike it, not just you tolerate it. If you don't hate your sin and you don't love his righteousness, I surmise you will have very difficulty standing firm in the faith. Three, preach to yourself that your standing firm is never done in vain. Preach to yourself. Preach to yourself that your standing firm is never done in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing, knowing, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Now listen, I understand it can be quite lonely to stand firm in the faith. It is. It's, it's, it's quite lonely, especially at work. Some of you guys have told me you work at a job where you're the only Christian there. It's hard. It's hard to stand firm. I, I know what that's like. I've been in a job before where I was the only Christian. It's hard to stand firm in the faith if you're the only Christian. Or at the family dinner table, 
You know, you got your mom, your dad, your grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, cousin, other cousin, this guy, you don't even know how you're related to him. And you're the only Christian at that table. It is lonely to stand firm in that situation. Or among your friends. If you hang out with a group of friends that are all lost, you're the only Christian. It's, it's lonely to stand firm. And that loneliness, here's what it does. It's a great temptation to capitulate to the status quo. It will tempt you to capitulate to just go with the status quo. Preach to yourself. Preach to yourself in those moments that God sees your faith. God sees you standing firm in the faith. It hasn't gone unnoticed. It hasn't gone and it won't go without reward. He sees it. Your labor is not in vain. Four, don't make peace with our Achilles heel. Don't make peace with our Achilles heel. And I know y'all are all very educated, probably more, way more educated than I am. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you're aware, with, aware what that means. But if you're not sure what, what is an Achilles heel uh, um, outside of like the physical Achilles heel, where is that? Why is it called an Achilles heel? Achilles was a, a figure in Greek mythology. He was strong, like unbeatable. He had one weakness, though, his Achilles heel. Uh, got shot with an arrow. That was his weakness. So it ended up becoming a metaphor for weakness. An area, like even though we might be strong in every area, we have one weakness. So where do I get with this? Ephesians 6, 11 and 13. Notice what Paul says here. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Now notice the word that occurs twice in that passage. Whole. Whole. Put on the whole armor of God. I mean, if you're a soldier and you put on 90% of your armor... Well, where do you think the enemy is going to shoot? The 10%. Put on the whole armor of God. I think sometimes that I, you know, I've, I've made this argument, and maybe you have too. You know, we say, that's just my weakness. You know, this, this area, this, this one sin, this, this one thing, it's just my weakness. It's always been my, uh, basketball's always been my Achilles heel. I mean, it's just, yeah, it is. Girls have always just been my Achilles heel. I love them. Work, overworking has always just been my Achilles heel. We all have those areas. Every Christian has those areas. Don't make peace with them. Don't settle into a status quo with them and make peace with them. You won't stand firm if you do. Five, have open ears and a moldable heart. Open ears and a moldable heart. Hebrews 3, 14 to 15. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. I have not taken care of my body through the years. Uh, you can take that a lot of different ways. I don't mean it in one sense. I mean it in this sense. Um, I used to listen to rock music with headphones on, uh, turned all the way up. Like, I would just hit max, right? For extended periods of time. And now I don't have the best hearing. Um, the other day I went to the pharmacy and, and the, the pharmacist was talking to me and I was like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't hear what the pharmacist was saying. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, I would never stretch before exercising. Uh, Cause I mean, when, I mean, like, I, mean, I see you guys when you play, I don't stretch, a lot of y'all don't. Yeah, you're gonna regret that. Uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't stretch and uh, 
I, w- I would play hurt all the time. I mean, there was no such thing as sitting out. Like, you, you always play hurt. Um, and now I have bad hearing and very stiff and inflexible muscles and a lot of injuries. Here's my point in all of this. Sin or even passivity can do the same for our spiritual walk. We can fill our ears and our minds and our hearts with so much noise that it becomes difficult to discern the voice of God. He says today, if you hear his voice, if you hear it, we can go about the Christian life passively rather than actively. And here's the thing, your hearts will atrophy. They will. If you live your Christian life, if I live my Christian life passively rather than actively, your heart will naturally atrophy. It will. God speaks to us and we're too stiff to be molded. We're too set in our ways. Have open ears. Keep your ears open. Have a moldable heart. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Six, resist the devil. 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in the faith. Satan wanted to destroy Job. He tried to. He wanted to destroy King David. He tried to. He wanted to destroy Peter. He tried to. He wanted to destroy Jesus. He tried to. And he wants to destroy you and me. Make no mistake, Satan doesn't just want to cause you to fall into sin. He wants to destroy you. All the way. All the way to hell. He has no other purpose. That's his sole reason to exist. It's to oppose you. He opposes God by opposing you and me. That's his modus operandum. He does nothing night and day except that one thing, opposing the people of God and blinding the minds of unbelievers. And Peter says, resist him, resist him, resist him. And seven, last point, under point eight. Rest in the faithfulness of our God. How do you stand firm in the faith? Rest in the faithfulness of our God. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The Christian life can be a discouraging one, right? Every time we fall into sin, we feel discouraged, shameful, like, man, I messed up again. Every time we cower in fear at the work party or the dinner table with our family, man, I missed my opportunity again. How do we find rest in the midst of that? How do we find peace and rest that we so desperately seek with all these feelings of frustration and feelings of failure? How do you find that? Rest in the faithfulness of God. You don't rest in your faithfulness. You rest in His faithfulness. Praise God that our standing firm does not rest on our faithfulness, but His. Amen? We don't stand firm because we are faithful. We stand firm because he is faithful. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you, don't lose your peace. Don't lose your security. Don't lose your rest and your assurance in a cloud of sin and shame. Let the faithfulness of God be a sunbeam that pierces that cloud and the fog will lift. It will. All right, that's all point eight. Point nine. Paul follows up his positive imperative with a negative imperative. Right? And 
Nothing spectacular about that. I just point it out because I want to make a point with this. Um, and the point is this. We are given both positive commands in Scripture and we're given negative commands in Scripture. And we would do well to highlight both. We would. So, for example, what, what does that mean? For example, positive commands. You know, things like uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength. Something we should do. Love your neighbor as yourself. Take up your cross. These are all things that we do. But negative commands would be things that we're commanded not to do. Do not get drunk with wine. Do not lie. Don't provoke your children to anger. And on and on and on. Now, as Christians, it can be easy to be defined by one set of commands or the other. For instance, a positive Christian is somebody that does a lot, but they don't abstain from a lot. So they're defined by what they do and not by what they don't do. Or a negative Christian abstains from a lot, but doesn't do a lot. So we're defined by what we don't do and not what we do. I wasn't, I wasn't going to say it. But surely we can see it's both, right? For the Galatian church, it's not enough to just stand firm. They must also not submit to a yoke of slavery. And it's not enough to just not submit to a yoke of slavery. They must also stand firm. Standing firm in freedom is defined by what we do and what we don't do. Both are necessary. Make sure that you, you know, if you gravitate towards, and, I, and, and I, you've met these people, maybe you are one of them, I, I've met them, I, I've been them, where your life is really defined about everything you stay away from rather than what you gravitate towards. Or your life is all about what you gravitate towards and not what you stay away from. Both are necessary. Both are needed. Both are Christianity. 10. What does the word submit mean in this verse? He says don't submit to it. What does that word submit mean? If you look at different translations, you'll see how this word is translated differently. ESV, NRSV, CSV translated as submit. NASB and Net Bible have subject. Uh, NIV has burdened. New King James has entangled. Don't get entangled. The word is defined as to experience constraint or to be loaded down with. I think either one can be uh, used. I like how the NIV translates this, and here's why. It's the only translation that brings out the passive aspect of the verb. The verb that's used there is passive, and NIV brings out this sense. NIV says, stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again. So it's the idea of don't let yourself be burdened again. So in other words, this slavery, this is not the kind of slavery where someone comes to you, they hit you over the head, they kidnap you, and then sell you as a slave, and you wake up and you're in chains. And you're like, how did this happen? No. This is a free man or woman who knows that they are free and little by little or all at once they let themselves become enslaved they let themselves become burdened that's what paul is saying don't let this happen don't let yourself become enslaved 11 if paul gives the command not to submit it seems to imply that we might submit right if he says don't do this it seems to imply that someone would or in other words, if Paul says, uh, another way to word it, don't let yourself be burdened again. It seems to imply that we might let ourselves be burdened again. Now, why? How or why would someone do this? Why would any Christian let themselves be burdened? Why would any Christian let themselves be subjected again? That's the question. I think why is because this subjection, this burdening, this allowing oneself to be burdened is not something done actively, but passively. It's not done actively. It's done passively. This is why Paul exhorts them to stand firm. It implies that to not stand firm is to dangerously flirt with allowing ourselves to be burdened again. 
Now, for the Galatian context, it was being burdened by the law, but that's not really our context necessarily. We don't really struggle with being, I mean, we do struggle sometimes with legalism and, and uh, performance and whatnot, but for the most part, we're not, we don't have the same struggle that they do. We're not struggling with, you know, should I eat pork or not? Like, we're all eating bacon, right? <laughs> Except for my boys. My boys don't like bacon. I'm like, oh my, I know. Don't they? They don't like that. Some of them don't. I'm like, you know those memes of like, who doesn't like bacon? My kids don't like bacon. Uh, I know. We're not struggling with, um, you know, should I, should I get circumcised or not? Right? That's not our struggle. That was theirs. That's not. So what is our struggle? How, how might we let ourselves be burdened again? With us, it's sin. Us, it's, it's sin. We might let ourselves be subjected to sin. We might let ourselves be burdened with sin. Um, how does that work? When I was a kid, uh, we used to go to the beach all the time uh, because we, uh, we only lived like uh, 45 minutes from it. And uh, the beaches in uh, um, southern Alabama and the Florida Panhandle are some of the best beaches in the United States. And I think I can say that. I've been to a lot of beaches. But the, the water and the sand and the temperature, and yeah, it's, it, it's great. We used to go all the time. When I was a kid, I would get in the water um, before I saw the movie Jaws, and, uh, and now I never get in the water. Uh, but I would get in the water, and I'd play around for like 30 minutes or so, just, you know, jumping around and whatnot. And uh, when it was time to come in, I would swim back in. When I got to the shore, I was confused. I was looking around, and I was like, I couldn't find my parents. And I was so confused, like, where are they? I thought they left me. What had happened? The current had slowly pushed me down like 400 yards. Now, I didn't swim 400 yards down. I had no idea that I was 400 yards down. Because obviously, you know, when you're a kid, you don't ever think about your parents. You're just in the water playing around, and you're like, same thing can happen with your walk to move three four hundred yards whatever that equates to in spiritual terms you don't have to actively swim you don't have to actively go and sin you don't have to actively go and seek out anything if you just wade spiritually wade whatever that would be you'll drift you will There is no middle ground. There is no plateau. If you just, spiritually speaking, just exist, just, you will drift. Sometimes we do that. We don't even know we're doing it. Maybe this morning, right, this applies to you. You don't even know that you've been drifting for the past two weeks, two years. I pray that even hearing this right now, that this would serve as a shore for you. That you would come to the shore and see, oh my gosh. What, where am I? Where's my dad? Where's my dad? I haven't talked to him in a while. Twelve. What is a yoke? Paul says, don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. We don't use that word yoke. What's a yoke? This is what a yoke is. That middle bar right there. It's a yoke. It's a literal yoke, right? Yoke was a wooden bar or frame that would use to join two animals together. You know, you got to pull a heavy load. You need more than one ox to pull it, but you also don't want them walking in separate directions. Put a yoke on them. They're going to walk together pull this load now obviously paul is speaking metaphorically here he's not referring to this literal yoke here so he's using a metaphor a yoke would signify two things number one subjection meaning that that animal is subject to its master the fact that you put a yoke on it it's subject to you it's going to do whatever you tell it to do and two it means union the two animals are united they're in union because of this yoke So subjection and union. And so Paul draws upon this image, this metaphor, 
that would have been perfectly understandable to them. It's a little bit foreign to us because we're not agrarian, but for them was perfectly understandable. And it was a common, let me just show you this to you. This was a common metaphor that the biblical writers did all throughout scripture. Really quick, God told Jeremiah, thus the Lord said to me, make yourself straps and yoke bars and put them on your neck. Now, some scholars think that that's not meant to be metaphorical, that Jeremiah literally made a yoke and put it on himself as a prophetic symbol to the people. This was a symbolic action. Uh, uh, even as early as lamentations, sin was seen as a yoke. My transgressions were bound into a yoke, and by his hand they were fastened together. They were set upon my neck. The law was seen as one giant yoke. Acts 15, Peter stands up and says, Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Idolatry was seen as a yoke. So Israel yoked himself to the Baal of Peor. They yoked themselves to that God, which means you're yoked to the one you worship. And friendship and marriage is the one that often gets quoted. Friendship or marriage can be seen as a yoke. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, we often quote that with relationships and marriages, but it also applies to friendships. In the context, of the most immediate application is friendships. And in case you're sitting there wondering, that pastor said we shouldn't hang out with the world. That's not what I said. I said don't be yoked to them. Spend time with the world. Don't be yoked with them. If you want to know the difference, you can come see me after. For Paul's context here, the yoke refers to the dependence on the law to save. Paul says that don't submit again to a yoke. Well, what yoke? The yoke of depending on the law to save them. That's the yoke. The Mosaic law, all 613 commands. That was a yoke that was placed upon the nation of Israel. And Paul says, and the Judaizers are trying to take this yoke and put it on their neck. And Paul says, don't let it. Don't let them put this on your neck. Stand firm. 13, what is slavery? Now well, we know what slavery is. So more specifically, why does Paul call dependence on the law slavery, right? He says, don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. So it's, in other words, he's saying, depending on the law to save you is slavery. Why does he say that? Why does he say that depending on the law is slavery? We looked at this verse just a minute ago, and I think Peter gives us a clue. When Peter stood up at the Jerusalem council and he asked the church, he said, church, why are you putting God to the test by trying to place a yoke on these disciples that we have never been able to bear? We've never been able to properly bear this yoke. We believe we'll be saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as they will. What Paul is saying is that depending on the law to save you is slavery because you can never keep the law. You'll never be set free. And Paul is exhorting the Galatians, don't do this. Don't submit to this. Don't depend on anything in your life to save you except Jesus Christ. 14, last one. What is a yoke of slavery? He says, don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. What, more specifically, what is that exactly in our context today? In our context today. Um, let me say this first. Um, freedom is not freedom from a yoke. Freedom is not freedom from a yoke. Freedom in Christ is freedom to be yoked to Christ. It's the only kind of yoke that is freeing instead of enslaving. Jesus says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Why? For I am gentle. I am lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
Now, if you're ever wondering, because I, sometimes I read that, and I'm like, God, uh, Christianity is not easy. It's not light. What, what does Jesus mean? Christianity is hard. It's heavy. What do you mean your yoke is easy and light? Let me, give, let me close with the differences between all other yokes and the yoke of Jesus. Here's the difference. Here's the difference between any other yoke and the yoke of Jesus. This could be the yoke of your job, which is going to suck every bit out of you if you let it. The yoke of even marriage, which is a godly yoke, but it's not a salvific yoke. The yoke of pleasure, which is not a bad thing, but in and of itself will send you to hell. Here's the difference between every other yoke and the yoke of Jesus. All other yokes only offer temporary satisfaction. The yoke of Jesus always offers permanent satisfaction. All of the yokes, we, that's why we always need the next high. It's why we always need the next kick, the next buzz, the next thrill, the next adventure. That's how drugs work. That's how idolatry to adventure and vacations work. You always need something next. Something else. The yoke of Jesus is the only yoke that offers permanent satisfaction. It is the only yoke that can say, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Guys, if you're tired, there are some in this room that I know are tired of trying to be happy. Trying to figure out what's the point of life. It's Jesus Christ. All of the yokes take and take and take and take and take and take. The yoke of Jesus gives and gives and gives and gives and gives. All of the yokes say, you are on your own. Figure it out. You're on your own. If you're going to make it in this world, if you're going to be somebody in this world, it's up to you. You, you, you got to do it. The yoke of Jesus says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. All the yokes say, do more, be more, get more, succeed more. The yoke of Jesus says, trust that I am more. All the yokes say, work, 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 and work some more. The yoke of Jesus says, work, and you will find rest in your work. All the yokes are a harsh taskmaster that constantly chides, constantly scolds, constantly shames, constantly oppresses. The yoke of Jesus is gentle and lowly in heart. He is the father running to his prodigal son, not to chide him, but to be compassionate to him. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is the only yoke that will make you supremely happy. He's the only yoke that will make you supremely happy. Stand firm in the freedom that Christ has purchased for you. Don't submit to any other yoke. Don't let yourself be burdened by any other yoke. Stand firm in the joy that he purchased for you.